Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's CPARFIN conversation to celebrate Cerebral Palsy Awareness Month, featuring Zach Lerner and Colin Bowersock. I'm Jocelyn Cohen, and I'm the Vice President of Education with Cerebral Palsy Alliance Research Foundation, or CPARF for short. This event is closed caption enabled, and I've turned on transcription. It's being recorded, and we'll post it on our YouTube channel soon. For additional accessibility, I'll share a visual description of myself. I'm a white woman with dark brown shoulder length hair that's down and brown eyes. I'm wearing large teal glasses and a lilac mock turtleneck sweater. There's a CPARF related background behind me that has white and different hues of green. And sometimes I may look like my eyes are looking away from the screen or rolling, but that's part of my cerebral palsy. In case this is your first online event with us, I'd like to tell you a bit about what CPARF does. Despite being the world's most common lifelong physical disability and affecting 18 million people worldwide, cerebral palsy is one of the most underfunded conditions. That's why CPARF funds research and technology that will positively change what it's like to live with cerebral palsy. On the scientific side, we're currently funding an array of projects that address cerebral palsy at all ages and stages of life. CPAR-funded research projects focus on chronic pain, technology, regenerative medicine, genomics, adulthood, and early detection and early intervention. The discoveries that researchers make today will make a difference for millions of people for generations to come. On the innovation front, we run Remarkable US, the US-based disability tech startup accelerator that's part of the Global Remarkable Accelerator Program. And through seed funding, mentorships, deep dives, and support, we help startups bring affordable, life-changing technology one step closer to the people with disabilities who need it, because the world isn't built for disabled people. But thankfully, there are companies that place disability at the forefront, and Remarkable US is working with them. They're built to fill in gaps, meet crucial needs, and make accessibility accessible. Tonight's guests touch both parts of our mission with their work. Zach Lerner co-founded Biomodem five years ago, a company that was in our first ever Remarkable US cohort in 2022, and that helps reshape what it's like for ambulatory people with cerebral palsy to move. He's an associate professor at Northern Arizona University, and he earned his PhD from Colorado State University. Colin Bowersock is a postdoctoral researcher at Northern Arizona University's College of Engineering, Informatics, and Applied Sciences. He is the current CPAR Fellowship recipient with his project focused on at-home use of robotic exoskeletons, and he works closely with Zach. I'm so excited to kick off this conversation. So first, um, Zach first, and then Colin, can you tell us a bit more about yourselves and your professional backgrounds? Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, hi, everyone. Really excited to be here. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, uh, to talk with you about our work and our mission. So uh, my background is in engineering. And um, as you learned five years ago, we were fortunate enough to create a spinoff company from our research group at Northern Arizona. And this company is developing wearable assistive devices and rehabilitation tools, primarily for people with cerebral palsy and other, um, other conditions that affect how we walk. And you know, I'm really passionate about two things. So the first is robots, and the second is human mobility. I am really passionate about um, our ability to to move. And um, for me personally, I like getting outside in nature and you know being able to um, to recreate in that sense. And so my work is really dedicated to joining these two loves. So applying robots to help people move. And I think there's no better cause than individuals with cerebral palsy. And um, seven years ago, when I started as an assistant professor, I think, you know, it was really obvious to me that I wanted to work with children, children with movement disorders. And that's where I saw we can make a really big impact. And that's how I'm here today. Thank you, Zach. I love hearing stories like this. And Colin, I'm excited to hear yours too. Uh, yeah, I'm Colin Bowersock. Um, I grew up in a small town in North Texas. Um, there I was a bit of an athlete. I uh, grew up playing a lot of sports, uh, played some sports in college, and that's what kind of got me interested into human movement and 
interested in how we move, the way we move, and how we can move better. Um, I began kind of my academic career um, studying uh, running um, as a gait pattern. I looked at how we can change the way we run to reduce uh, joint loads in um, people who may have joint injury or at risk for joint injury. Um, after that, I continued my research out in uh, Virginia. Um, I, there, I started studying more about the motor control of movement, trying to understand why we may move the way we move and how injury or age or disease starts to affect those things. Um, and then um, I received my PhD from Old Dominion University in Virginia. And after that, I moved to the University of Louisville. Um, there, I worked at the uh, Kentucky Spinal Cord Injury Research Center. Um, there, I really got to investigate uh, motor control um, in these populations and how we're able to move based on the inputs that our bodies received and how we can rehabilitate after some um, disabilitating injuries. Uh, at uh, that university was the first time I was really introduced to using robotic technology um, to enhance um, rehabilitation and specifically in that population. Um, so with that, um, I was got my interest in robotics, thought how it could be really useful in rehabilitation. Um, so I saw this uh, opportunity at Northern Arizona University who both uses robotics and then got back into kind of my love and looking at uh, gate rehabilitation. So that's how I ended up here. Thank you for sharing that. Um, it's always interesting to me to hear how someone's interests and passions shape their paths and then the things that they accomplish can shape the paths of the people that they're helping. So Colin, how did you and Zach first connect and specifically what drew you to robotic exoskeletons and mobility technology? Yeah, I think I briefly touched on this. Um, I was introduced to robotics in that in the U of L position. Uh, we used kind of a postural robotic um, stand trainer, is what it was called. Um, so there, we were allowed. To, uh, we were able to uh, use very precise and repetitive what we call perturbations, kind of pushes and pulls to individuals, um, which was cutting edge technology at the time and kind of still is. Um, so. That's how I got introduced to you know, robotics, but I was looking to make a move to get back into gate research and maybe something a little more widespread. Um, the technology used there um, was cutting edge, but as far as to the maybe a larger population, it was a little bit uh, smaller. Um, so while I was living in Kentucky, I visited a traveling physical therapist in Tucson, Arizona. And when my wife and I were down there, we really fell in love with Arizona, and we said, if we ever get the opportunity, we should try to move here. And then not too long after that, um, I came across a position in Zach's lab, um, and I couldn't believe my luck looking at the position. It, one was in Arizona, two used robotic technologies, and not only robotic technologies, but they were building and rebuilding and testing them within house. So it wasn't just they had a robot and they were using it, but they were continued to implement and make new ones. Um, so they were integrating all these, you know, technologies into specifically gate rehabilitation, which was really cool. Um, so I interviewed with Zach. Um, I was lucky enough to get the job offer. So I accepted the job and then I got married and then I moved and then here I am. That's a really happy story. Um, you mentioned, and you described this a little bit perturbations, which is like pushing people in different directions. Can you explain a little bit why that's helpful? Um, for someone's motor control or for increasing their balance or anything like that? Sure, so what we were testing there, um, these individuals had motor complete spinal cord injury. Um, so it's a very severe injury with, and what that leaves you with is no input um, from the brain below the level of lesion. Mm -hmm. um, but what we used there was these epidural stimulators, which is like a, kind of a, not quite a battery pack, uh, but electrodes that stimulate the spinal cord below where the injury occurred. Okay. And what that does is it kind of replaces um, some of the top-down inputs that we would get. And so we use these perturbations to then provide um, sensory information to the spinal cord. And then with that information, we studied how can the spinal cord respond without any input from the brain itself. 
So then we did these um, training exercises and these really intensive rehabilitation programs um, from postural stability is mostly what I focused on there. Other people did um, gait and mobility um, training studies. But what we found is that with enough training and with some other appropriate technologies, these individuals can uh, produce uh, muscle activity below these levels of, of lesion without any brain input. Uh, so it really gave me a good idea of, you know, again, how the spinal cord and what it is in, involved in in controlling our movements and things like that. That's helpful background information and really good insight. Thank you, Colin. Zach, um, can you explain how Biomodem, your company, creates mobility solutions for people with cerebral palsy and which people with CP would benefit the most from it? Yeah, great question. So we're really interested in creating practical wearable solutions. So wearable devices uh, that go on the body and that can be used anywhere. And we think that there are two broad applications for wearable technology, like wearable exoskeletons. So one application is in making walking easier. So if we can use motors and a small battery pack to provide assistance as we walk, we think it could be useful for walking around the community, maybe navigating stairs or other challenging terrain, um, walking with friends and family and things like that. Um, but we also understand that you know many individuals also want to improve their own function. So we're focused on creating uh, wearable rehabilitation interventions to improve muscle strength and coordination. So we can use the same wearable exoskeleton and we're targeting the ankle joint right now. I'll talk about why we do that in a second, um, but we can use this technology to um, facilitate improvements in motor control. So how we, how we move our joints and, and our limbs through our muscles. Um, does that answer your question? It does. Um, it answers the part of it. And then which people with CP would benefit the most? Yeah, I knew there was a part two <laughs> that I was forgetting. That's okay. Uh, so our technology is really geared for individuals with cerebral palsy that have some walking ability. Okay. Um, it's lighter weight technology. Um, it's meant for individuals, uh, GMFCS levels one, two, and three. So we see probably the best outcomes for individuals levels two and three. So those are individuals that um, have some ability to walk and but can really benefit from, from the technology. Mm -hmm. um, we are working on solutions for, for those that have a little bit more impairment um, that require upper, upper body support and stability. And so we're, we, you know, we're passionate about creating solutions that will work for everyone with cerebral palsy, mm -hmm. but where we've started is mainly targeted um, for individuals that have some ability to walk. I appreciate um, that you kind of picked a place to start, but also that you have all the folks with CP in mind um, for later projects down the line. It's, it's really good to hear. Um, can you delve a little bit, Zach, into the science behind the Biomodem Spark and what it really helps people with CP achieve? Yeah, I'd love to. So the Biomodem Spark is a wearable ankle exoskeleton. And we're targeting the ankle joint because the ankle joint is really critical for walking efficiently. So the ankle joint and the calf muscles provide positive push-off power. So they're really responsible for propelling us forward. And we know that some individuals with cerebral palsy have impairment at the ankle, and in particular in this forward propulsion. So having the calf muscles effectively propel us forward. Mm -hmm. We're targeting the ankle also because the way that we've designed the device, it also helps support the knee and, and can help um, extend the knee resulting in a more upright posture. You can imagine that this assistance at the ankle and support on the shin can help individuals walk in a more upright posture. And that's important because many individuals with cerebral palsy, as you know, um, can start to have a crouch gait pattern. Mm -hmm. And by targeting this particular joint in, in the way that we do, we're able to really make a positive impact, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, 
positive impact on making walking easier and, and in also in delivering some of the um, rehabilitation, uh, the targeted rehabilitation intervention. That's really great news. Um, I have a few questions to follow up. One is, um, in thinking about it, it's reminding me a little bit of the AFOs that I had as a kid, and those are designed also to sort of keep your legs in alignment. Does the spark help with internal rotation at the knee or not so much because it's more focused on the ankle? Yeah, not not so much. Um, it can help align the limb. Okay. Um, and because of the way that it secures the ankle, it can prevent the ankle from kind of dropping in and collapsing. Mm -hmm. So it can be helpful there. Okay. Um, and then the other question was, I'm thinking about, I mean, the, the really interesting thing with um, people with CP who walk, including myself, is that I feel like the way we walk is a signature move. Like I walk in a very specific way and my ambulatory friends with CP I can tell they have CP, but they walk all in their own ways because their bodies compensate in different ways. So I know, for example, I my PTs would say to me that I like hang out on my lower back to because I'm doing something with my muscles to compensate for weakness, which it definitely includes my very weak calves. So I'm personally excited about this device, but um, because you're talking about posture, do you think ultimately the spark or something like it could also help with that kind of tilt that someone like me would be doing in compensation as they're moving. Yeah, definitely. And, and Colin actually just got access to some really phenomenal videos um, with one of his his projects using the device where we have a side-by-side -side comparison of one of our participants walking with and without the device. Mm -hmm. And you can really visually see how assistance at the ankle is reducing the amount of kind of sway at the torso and okay. just creating a better posture all the way up. And it's really cool, cool finding and, and cool, um, I think impactful video to see. One thing I really quickly wanted to add mm -hmm. because you mentioned AFOs, I've never really met anyone who kind of thinks fondly of their AFOs. No. <laughs> I think one of the main reasons is because they're, they're, um, they're static. They don't, you know, the joint doesn't move very much or like, you know, the plastic doesn't yield. And so yeah. it can be uncomfortable to have your limb in the same position um, all day and while you're walking. So our device is highly dynamic. We're really trying to improve range of motion. Um, so that how much the joint, the joint moves. And, and that's something that I think contributes to it's the success we've seen in, in our pilot work. I love hearing that. Um, yes, I absolutely hated my AFOs as a child for a multitude of reasons, and I won't go down that rabbit hole, but you make a very good point there. Um, and what you're saying about posture, it helping with someone's posture, and I'd love to see those videos whenever we're allowed, is um, it makes me think about people like me aging with CP and how we have these weird back issues because everything in your body is connected, which is an obvious thing that gets overlooked. And so if you're swaying all the time, you're probably doing something to your back that you don't know you're doing until you're older. And then it's like, look what you did to your back. And so mm -hmm. the sooner someone can get a device like this, the more they'll be able to lessen the, the undue stressors on their back potentially. That's what I'm hearing from what you're saying. Is that accurate? It, 100%. And I think um, you are articulating a, a really interesting kind of future research direction for us. Um, and Happy so to do thank it. you, thank you for that <laughs> that firsthand experience. It's 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 really important that we hear these stories because you know everyone has a unique experience with with CP, mm -hmm. and um, you know ultimately we, we want we want our technology to help people across the lifespan. And I think we'll talk about this later, but yeah, um, yeah. Thank you for that. Okay, so. Um, the biomotive spark, which we've been talking about, has been used in several studies to examine ways to lessen energy use and increase assistance for people with cerebral palsy, um, as well as other studies that provided resistance for neuromuscular training. So Zach, can you share more about these studies and how they've influenced changes in the spark over the years? Yeah, so we've started our work using developing this device to make walking easier. So think of it like a, an e-bike for your feet that you can put on and wear so that you can walk 
more quickly, you can walk faster, take longer steps and use less energy. And, you know, as a, an example of how our research informed the development of the device, we'd have kids come in to the lab. We primarily work with um, kind of young adults, adolescents and kids, and they would start um, running if they were able, or they'd want to like kind of go through the lab doors and go outside. And so, you know, we've been really passionate about testing the technology outside of of the research lab on a treadmill and controlled environments because, you know, no one walks their dog around the park, around the block on a treadmill. Uh, and so that's really forced us to think about how do we control a device safely and, and in a highly dynamic environment where there are different terrains like stairs and ramps where you need to stop and start. And so our research has gone hand in hand with our, our kind of product development because it's, it's made us really, it's forced us to, to come up with practical solutions to some of these real world problems. Because we don't want some really complex machine learning model that works 90% of the time, but 10% of the time it causes someone to trip and fall down their stairs. Like that's technology that's never gonna be used. If, right. if there's any harm done, it, um, it, it's no one wins. And so that I think that's a really good example on that using the device as an assistive aid. Now, in terms of the re resistive, I've alluded to this, our technology targets the ankle muscles. And what we're trying to do is have the users of the device increase that the calf muscle recruitment. So we want the brain to tell that muscle to contract during push off when we're walking to make walking um, a, a little bit well, when you're using the device with resistance, it, it makes it harder. So the device is actually resisting that movement. And one thing we learned in research is that if we can give feedback to the user in the form of a display, a visual display or a sound, then there, it provides them some ability to um, learn how to use the device. We call this biofeedback. Okay. So we learned that by providing biofeedback um, back to the user, they're able to engage with the resistive mode better and our outcomes are better. So we see increases in muscle activity. And if we repeat that um, over several training sessions, we can see improvements in function. So comparing pre versus post training, not using the device, so this is just the person walking, uh, we see some carryover effect where there's some improvements in the, how that muscle functions and then it translates to improve measures of mobility um, like how far you can walk in six minutes. And so <laughs> we would do that. We did this research and um, we would have the physical therapist of the participant send a message with a family saying like, what is this child doing in their research? Because I'm seeing a, a huge step change in their function. And, you know, we loved hearing that. That's like, it's super exciting for us to hear like, oh, people actually noticed this. Yeah. We didn't have to tell them, but they noticed this. And, you know, the immediate reaction was like, we have to make this available. Uh, and one thing about research is it's really difficult to make technology available to the wider public. It's almost impossible unless you have a product that, um, that you can sell. So, and I don't mean like sell in the sense of making money, but a product that people can buy or hopefully insurance can reimburse. So there's mm -hmm. a whole team to support that product. Like, um, people can get trained on it. There's resources. They can send it somewhere when it breaks. And so um, that really motivated creating this company because I, I truly want to get this technology out there, um, but you can't do it in a lab. And um, so to, to conclude this winding answer, those are probably the two ways where our research has really informed the product. You covered a, real, a lot of really important ground. So thank you for your answer, even if you even if you think it's winding, uh, because it it does lead us um, to talk about the research that Colin is doing. So Colin, your CPAR funded fellowship grant is focused on at home use of the spark. Can you explain the specific science behind your work and what you hope to achieve with it? Uh, yeah, as, as Zach discussed, we've uh, the lab has built this spark device and uh, through many iterations, uh, it is, you know, now kind of where it is. And it's been rigorously tested and retested. And we've seen that in a laboratory setting, it works. It makes walking easier by seeing of like 
reduce metabolic cost. Um, for, you have used less muscle activity uh, to take steps and walks like that. Um, it can help you walk faster. They can help people take longer steps. It can help them walk for longer times and distances. So it does work in this sterile laboratory environment. Um, but now what we'd like to see is will people be able to use it on their own, on their own and how feasible is it to use in the home? Um, so in the home, there's no researcher there. Um, there's no one telling them to use it. There's no one putting it on form, showing them how to use it. So what um, this project, what I really want to get out of it is to understand, do individuals like using the device? Will they use the device on their own? Do they find it comfortable to use? And do they find it helpful in their everyday life? You know, is it easy to put on? Is it easy to, you know, figure out how to use? And then with this kind of back and forth, then we can also get some really important feedback from the user. What would they change about the device? What did they really like about it? And what didn't work so well for them? Um, so then, and I think that's again, what sets this lab apart from others. It's not an off the shelf device. We can take that feedback back into the laboratory, make these changes quickly, you know, not over years and years, but we can create these turnarounds pretty quick. And then, you know, try again with these, these new things. So I think that's, kind of the main focus of what this study is to see how useful this device is gonna be in the home and what changes need to be made to make it really useful um, for individuals. Thank you for sharing that. Can um, you share if there is an age range that you're gonna be recruiting for this study? Is it still just um, like kids and young adults or is it beyond that age range for now? Um, it's the device that we're kind of have be using for this specific study um, is not limited by age, but a little bit by the power it can produce. Okay. Um, so it's really helpful for subject or participants that are a little bit lighter, um, but once you get into um, larger adults um, or, you know, not even larger, just people of average size, oh, um, the device lot. doesn't, yeah, people. <laughs> Um, sometimes it provides a little, not quite enough power to really see the amount of benefits you would see um, in lighter individuals. So okay. we're not quite restricting it by age, but just by what we think who it's going to work best for. And so obviously when someone's younger, they're going to be shorter and have less weight on them, like just by virtue of their age. Um, I'll be curious to see down the line uh, how you adapt it to fit for adults who are, and like how you deal with the changes you have to make um, when someone is above whatever the weight is right now, like how, how you, how you allow for that um, in future iterations. When you say that you can also make the changes relatively quickly, is it something where, you know, if someone's participating in the study and they're like, this isn't working for me. And then you can make a change in a week or two, or is it, they do their time of participation and then you get their feedback. And so, you know, for future iterations outside of this trial, that those changes can be made. It would be the latter uh, okay. kind of what you explained that they would go through um, the training intervention and then we would get the feedback and see what they like, didn't like, and then we could make those changes. Okay. And we, you know, as research goes, you want to keep it as consistent as possible throughout the study. That way you can have consistent results. So we'll be providing kind of the same device set up in the same way to each of our participants to get kind of a wide range of feedback instead of providing a device, changing it, giving it to someone else, they want to change back the other way. And so then it gets a little construed. That um, makes, yeah. And the, these devices are a bit customizable too. Um, we can provide participant specific assistant levels. So if some people might want more assistance, some people might want less assistance, um, some individuals have, you know, a more affected side that mm -hmm. they may want more assistance on that side, less on the other. So it's not so rigorous that it's going to act the same way. Um, there's also different sizes for different heights of people, um, different, you know, how big are your feet, how long are your shank, your, you know, how tall are you, things like that. So they're a bit customizable to the point that, but they will behave in a in kind of the same manner across uh, this work. That's great information. Someone um, in in our Q and A is asking how they can sign up to participate in the study. 
Uh, well, I think we have um, on our website, I think we have like contact information. I think that's right, Zach. Yeah. Okay. About how to get involved in some of this research. And, you know, we have this research project, but it's not just this. And we have uh, six to seven, you know, projects going on at any time. And we're always looking for participants. So that would be very helpful okay. for us. Does someone yeah, need to be based in your area to participate? I've done some traveling um, and you know, some drivable distances. Okay. Um, um, it depends on kind of the project. If it's a single day project, multi day study, sometimes them, you know, they're a little bit longer term. So it kind of depends on how far away and what kind of uh, research we're doing. Okay. And I know who asked this question. So I'm also happy to connect with them offline and point them in, in the right direction, sort of what, you, you. Were, what you were sharing. Um, Colin, two other questions related to your work as well. What um, do you want other researchers to know about this work and what should care providers know about how your findings will potentially change CP treatment protocols for people of all ages? And Zach alluded to this as well when he was talking about how physical therapists couldn't believe, you know, the changes in people that were using um, the Spark. So curious for your thoughts on that. And if you need me to repeat anything, I'm happy to. Thank you. Um, yeah, as far as what other researchers um, like to know about this specific project, as I mentioned, we've seen in the lab that this device, you know, we'll say has the potential to, you know, help individuals. And I mean, we've shown it does help. But again, in order to really realize these benefits and whether they're going to carry over, you know, into someone's life, we really need to test this in individuals' homes and implement it into their life and into their lifestyle. Um, so that's kind of the main, that's what's kind of separating this project out with many of our other ones, is it's we kind of have a good idea this device works in a sterile environment. Now we want to see how people are going to use it and if they're going to use it. Um, so yeah, and then talking about how it can potentially change some uh, CP treatment protocols, um, I think you mentioned. Yes. Yeah. So in this work, I think, you know, we will probably, we'll see, we'll find that individuals, you know, may use it like using it. So it has the potential, as Zach mentioned, to be used as a, a walking aid, kind of like an everyday assistive device where it can help them walk further, um, help them keep up with friends, keep up with siblings, go for hikes and things like that. So they can put it on and then do an activity um, saving some energy and not having to work so hard or being able to go further. Um, yeah. But it also can be used in the rehabilitation um, as a rehabilitation device. One, just being able to walk more or having maybe an incentive to walk more. And then two, in that resistive mode where it's almost like targeted um, resistive training or like going to the gym to do some weightlifting. Here you don't are statically and just lifting weights, but it's more task specific. It's almost like wearing ankle weights as you walk, but it's even more targeted to that too. As you said, some individuals have, you know, decreased uh, muscle strength of the calves. Yeah. So here you would walk and try to not only strengthen um, those calf muscles, but to target, you know, activating them at the right times um, and really just get them more involved in the neural system. So we hope that it can kind of supplement um, and maybe augment some of that um, at-home physical therapy that people are already receiving. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's exciting to me because for people with cerebral palsy, there are muscles that are always firing and there are muscles that we cannot get our brain to turn on for the life of us. There are also muscles that, according to my physical therapist, I am somehow activating, but it doesn't even feel like it. And so it feels like this could potentially be a great supplement for that where no matter how hard I try in my brain, I don't feel like I'm doing something to that muscle, but a device, this device could help with something like that, which is really important. And then it, you know, has the positive ripple effect that you were talking about. So, um, a lot of people with CP resist physical therapy, including at-home rehab for a variety of reasons. Colin, how will your findings through this study help close or even eliminate that gap? Well, I'm not sure we can eliminate the gap, but I think um, we've seen in preliminary testing, people really like using the device. 
they put it on and as soon as they put it on um they're like can you take a picture of me with this device can you take a video of me walking in it and i mean it feels awesome you put it on and then it helps you walk it makes walking easier it you makes you walk faster it's less energy um you kind of walk some people experience like more upright walking and straightforward um and you're wearing a robot which is you know it's like the days of the future it's the yeah. future you like strap in this robot you get to control it you get to walk with it um so i don't know if we'll you know eliminate the gap but i do think it has the potential to at least increase some act home engagement um and then for the study that um i kind of mentioned that we're going to be doing um taking these devices to the home i also am able to receive information from the device so i know when they're using it how long they've used it um, in what manner they've used it. And so it won't be a direct part of this research study, but later on, there could be some at-home communication or some incentives. A physical therapist could then realize, hey, you haven't used your device in two days, mm -hmm. you know, and send a little message and like, think about going for a walk today using the device. So again, I think people like using it. It's pretty fun. Um, I don't think it's gonna eliminate some of that really targeted physical therapy um, that's necessary, these tasks specific and trying to mm -hmm. strengthen or activate really certain things. But I do think it enclosed the cap of like just being a little more active and with the different um, kind of the dynamic ability of it being a walking aid and a rehabilitation tool. Um, I think we can get a little more or hopefully uh, increase kind of the at-home therapy. Yeah, you can choose your own adventure based on what your energy level is at the time, which is very variable for people with CP. Yeah. Um, even within the same person, it varies quite a bit. Um, what do each of you want your fellow researchers and innovators and scientists in the CP space to know about your respective and collaborative work? And I'll start with Zach on that one. Um, good question. One, one thing that comes to mind is, um, I think I'd like to share maybe some of our the challenges that we have sure. and that, that we've kind of overcome with the hope that it can facilitate improved research projects for other researchers. Um, well, I think it's it's um, it's really critical. So something that we've learned, you know, as we go to design a study, it's really critical that we kind of uh, test out the new intervention or the new design. Um, if we're kind of innovating on the technology, it's, it's really critical that we involve the the target recipient early in that process, because we have this tendency of thinking, oh, we know the answer, um, and we may not even be asking the right question, and it's kind of becomes painfully obvious when you invite kind of your future research participants in. Um, you can kind of gauge their responses and, and they can, you can infer if you are on the right track or not. So sometimes I just want to share that we've gotten a little bit ahead of ourselves and um, have done some things that maybe weren't so relevant um, where now we've learned to, you know, invite individuals with cerebral palsy into the lab early on in that process. So we can really make sure that we're trying to solve something that they care about. I appreciate your honesty with that. It's really true. Colin, do you have anything to add there? Uh, yeah, I would just want people to know that we are, you know, every day pushing to create this, this device. And the point is not to show off. It's not to look how cool and fancy our device is. It's not to, you know, have the most published papers or like, you know, tell people how great we are. It's truly to make a device that, you know, will be useful to individuals who need it. And we hope that, you know, that the device can be expanded into, you know, can help a, a lot of people. I mean, we want people to be using this device to get out and enjoy the things that they want to do, to go for hikes, to go see things in nature that maybe they're missing out on because of their current walking disability. Um, and also, I mean, we are not we're aware of like how expensive everything can be. And especially, you know, not only today, but especially when you get into the, you know, medical rehabilitation, yeah. the devices are expensive. The medical attention that individuals needs are very expensive. 
and then the you know adaptive equipment people need are expensive. So we're trying to create a device that you know could be useful to many people and get into the home and not just again create some real fancy cool you know device that will never see the light of day that's only kind of a concept but we really are striving to create a usable um, wearable device that can be used by those who need it something that is affordable which is not a word often associated with assistive tech so <laughs> i know that we appreciate that here at cparf and that everyone in the CP community will also appreciate that. Going back to Zach, um, this collaboration shows the important interplay between research and technology in the general disability and specific CP spaces. How is that connection between research and tech created at Biomodem and how has it evolved? And what can other researchers and innovators learn from you on this front? Uh, you know, I've spoken about this earlier um really we're using um I, I think our user centric research to inform the technology that we think has the most promise and um it i think we've started to pay more and better attention to individual users uh, or i guess potential future users so individuals um that with cerebral palsy that we think will benefit from the technology really trying to capture their story so that we can create relevant solutions. And um, too often, and we've been guilty of this, but you know, too often you create a tool and then try and find a problem that it solves. And again, we, we, we've been guilty of this, but yeah, I'd say we're now acutely aware of it and trying to, to remedy that and um, really making sure that the products that we hope to kind of, release into the world um, will have the best chance at success in, in changing lives. And research plays into that. Like when, by involving your devices in active research trials, you are like creating a good feedback loop in a way that if you were creating technology in a vacuum or doing some theoretical research, that neither of those things would be true, that you'd just be doing tech for tech's sake and research for research, research's sake. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a great kind of loop that you've created between researchers and technology innovators. Um, Colin, what do you have to add on this question? Uh, not too much. Zach <laughs> is really the biomodem guy. I'm mostly the, uh, the research guy. I understand. Yeah. But you know, I, I you would, like the tech for your research studies. That's how it works. <laughs> yeah, I, I would add that which critical, um, the critical role that research plays is we need to make sure that the devices are effective, I think mm -hmm. first and foremost. And through rigorous research, clinical research, that that's how you evaluate that. And so we're not going to be, uh, we shouldn't be developing technology that doesn't work. And that's why it's so important to to do these research studies early on in the development. Right, that's why it's a, a crucial symbiotic relationship. Um, so someone asked, how do you think early use of the device might affect um, and perhaps increase the acquisition of the ability of individuals with CP to walk? So I know you were talking about um, right now that it serves folks in the GMFCS levels one to three, those are all folks who are already ambulatory. And then when you're in the levels four and five, you're not yet ambulatory. Um, so is there anything you can add sort of to what you said earlier about uh, how this could affect someone's ability to walk, especially if it's applied earlier in their life? Yeah, I think, we've heard that earlier early intervention is is really important mm -hmm. and I, the way that i think about that is if you intervene early you can really change the trajectory of someone's entire life in terms of their walking ability and that's why we're passionate about working with with younger individuals and again we're not excluding older older individuals but um, if you think about the number of disability years that we can affect Mm -hmm. The earlier you intervene, um, the kind of the, the greater that is. Yeah. We've worked with individuals as young as five. I have five-year-old twin boys. Oh my goodness. And it is, it's, they're a handful. It's a lot of fun to, yeah. to work with um, 
the on the younger side of things, the younger kids, and you learn a lot. Um, I I do think it, it's important that um, this technology gets tested and applied to um, to individuals as they're learning how to walk. So this could be for for younger individuals or older individuals who have received appropriate treatment and are ready to take their first steps, you know, maybe as teenagers or in their twenties or thirties. Mm -hmm. um, so this type of wearable technology we think can be really helpful in that transition. Yeah, I appreciate that answer. I would also add that um, from the, from the aged side of things that, you know, our abilities to stand still or to walk for longer periods of time, change earlier in our lives so like where it could affect an adult in their 50s or 60s it's hitting ambulatory folks with cp in sometimes their 20s late 30s 40s um so on the flip side of what you were saying it's almost like you're looking to achieve two different things one is sort of to help create the neural pathways and the muscle memory in the younger folks and for people in my age range and a little bit behind me and past me it's to help res potentially restore um, some function that we previously had that has diminished or just straight up gone away. Um, so I just wanna bring that to light too, because I think both sides of that are really important. Um, we have some practical questions in the Q&A as well. Someone asked about the weight of the device, how long it takes to attach, and the charge time for the battery pack. Yeah, I can I tackle can... those. Oh, <laughs> you wanna give that to Colin? I'll give it to Colin. Yeah, I can speak. I've done a little bit um, in this work of seeing how long it takes people to put on the device and things like that. Um, we found it takes anywhere between three and five minutes, and that's putting on the device and also connecting it um, to like a phone or a tablet uh, to control it. Okay. Um, and we found that to be pretty comparable um, to how long it takes people to put on their AFOs if they use them. So it's not too long uh, to attach it. And, you know, with time, they've all gotten a bit faster. Um, as far as the battery, um, the battery can last, depending on, you know, how much assistance you're using, it can last up to an hour. Um, and that's with a pretty small battery, uh, smaller than a cell phone. Okay. We have bigger batteries if um, would need it. Um, and I think, oh, there's another question about the weight of the device. Zach, do you have that? Yeah, it's about four pounds and we really focused on making it light where it counts so it's really light at the ankle joint okay. and there's a little fanny pack that has the motors and the battery and so we really focused on making it so that you don't really notice it when you're wearing it the kind of the the added aspect to that right the only thing you would notice is if you had it on resistance mode like yeah, it's not yeah. its weight is not itself causing the resistance for you. You have to turn that mode on for the weight. That's to right. Up. And the other thing you really notice is when you turn off the assistance. Mm -hmm. So like you're walking and then all of a sudden, let's say if we do a research protocol or we're messing around, we're testing it on ourselves or whatever, you turn it off. It's like the, you've slammed your brakes and all of a sudden it's like you're walking around, you know, on the beach with boots on and there's sand and you're like, it's, it's um it's a really cool feeling actually <laughs> the transition in, in the, i guess but in, in the like, in the sense that like you know <laughs> that sounds horrible it, it's it's <laughs> good to know that the device is working yes. and you like it's amazing um how quickly you kind of get used to it and then you when you take it away it's like oh it was really like super helpful that i think is cool um apologies for how that came out no that's okay i i knew what you were saying um but that also points to hopefully that you could have longer battery life because if, if I'm, let's just, I'm using myself as an example, I'm out walking in the city with my friends, I'm going to be out for longer than an hour <laughs> and to then just have to trudge back when I walk their light on air would be really sad. Yeah. <laughs> um, so is there any development happening with like extended battery life um, or will that sort of follow after Colin's study about the at-home use because you have to see how people are are acclimating and liking it in the at-home setting. Yeah, I can tackle that. So we're um, developing a way to design the device that uses is more efficient in terms of battery consumption. Okay. So we can incorporate springs, specifically lightweight carbon fiber springs to offload what the motor has to produce. And this essentially doubles the the time and and 
or distance that you can achieve on a single um, single battery charge. We've also really made it easy to change batteries. So you could bring an extra battery and just okay. and do a quick swap and you'd be kind of back to walking on cloud nine or whatever. Oh, great. I'll take it. Okay. <laughs> In my hypothetical future where I also have this device. <laughs> yeah. um, so we have a bunch more questions. I don't know that we'll be able to get to every one of them. Um, but I'll I'll kind of chunk two together from the same person who asked the ideal weight and height for using this device. And maybe Colin can answer that. And also, I think this was addressed before, um, but if it's possible to use on both legs or just one. And I'll add a corollary to that, which is then are there two battery packs if you have it on both of your legs? Or is there like a joint one and it's a different device when you're using it on both? I'll start with Colin and then if Zach needs to chime in, go for it. Yeah, the, uh, the uh, ideal, you know, we don't have like an ideal weight. Um, I am about 5'8 on a good day and about 160 pounds. And I'm kind of at that threshold of it des It helps me. Um, I can feel the assistance, okay. um, but I'm back kind of topping out of um, any kind of return. Um, so any bit over that, it gets a little heavy. Okay. Um, I think later on we'll talk about another device that may get over that. Um, and then the question about both legs. Um, the device, um, so it's, um, like Zach said, you have a, almost a fanny pack. Mm -hmm. And then it's right on your back, just right above kind of your, your butt, is the motors and the battery. Okay. And then from that, it's two um, kind of steel cable wires that are housed, so they're not dangerous. And they go right on down to um, the ankle. And that's where they provide, um, you know, push off assistance. Mm -hmm. So it's on both limbs and it's always on both limbs. Now, okay. if for some reason you wanted to kind of turn it off one side and just keep one side on, you could. But it's okay. definitely for both legs and it's all controlled. Yeah, one battery pack, uh, kind of one computer, you know, CPU and all that. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, because someone, if they had hemiplegia where CP is only affecting one of their legs, they would just turn off the, if they wanted to, but I guess it makes it easier for everybody, whether or not you have CP to walk. So maybe they wouldn't turn it off on the other side. Right. We've seen, I've had um, just some, um, you know, feedback with some participants. They do like maybe higher on one side. Yeah. In the beginning, it's kind of takes some getting used to, but yeah, um, no one's really like, I don't want any. Uh, right. Because it makes it easier to walk. And, you know, that's yeah. kind of the point. I mean, that um, makes sense can, also. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah, but you can change uh, between the limbs um, how much assistance you're getting on one side versus the other. That makes sense also, because even I have diplegia. So as an example, one, one of my legs is, I'll call it more affected by CP. So it's tighter. It turns in a little bit more. It's the cause of 99% of my trips and falls. That one, I would put more assistance on if I were using this device and I would still assist my left leg, which still definitely has CP and definitely causes me some issues, um, but is my standout. And so I would give it a little bit less assistance. Um, yeah, and just, to, just to add to that, I saw a question about, it kind of referred to a foot drop or toe drop, mm -hmm. I think is what they referred it to. Yeah. Um, so we didn't want to get too technical, but the device not only helps you push down, so it helps you push off. But once your foot's in the air, it also picks the toe up. That's so it does kind of solve that issue of um, some, like the AFOs, you know, they're real rigid, but they keep you from having that toe drop for, from trips. So this device still allows full range of motion, but then once the foot's in the air, it helps you pick up that foot. So you do have that nice heel toe contact as you progress to your game. Yeah, I mean, that's my, what, no, yeah. I saw my friend in the questions. I think that's the question that you saw our physical therapists in our youth heel toe all the time. Like that is what you have to do. And the amount of brain space you have to use to walk in a heel toe gate when that's not your actual gate, it's a tremendous amount of mental energy. So even though you're, you're saying how it's saving energy, like, I know you mean physical, but it's definitely also saving that mental energy of having to think as much to pick your foot up. So as not to drop your foot and fall on your face or on your hands or where, however you're going to fall. So, you know, knowing that you have a device that is supporting you takes a mental load off of your mind. It also means you can have like converse. I'm, I'm extrapolating, but I just know how much 
thought it takes to walk. Like you could have more conversations, more fluid conversations with the people that you're walking with and things like that. So it's a, it's really exciting development. Um, I see one other question about, I mean, I see a bunch of questions, but um, would someone with Crouchgate be able to use the Spark? And also someone else asked, um, is it usable with any type of shoe? And then I think my last question from this, which is sort of a good conclusion question is, can it be purchased and is it on the market? Basically, how do I get this or how can I get this in the future? It's a lot of questions I can repeat if you need. So type of shoe, any type of shoe, um, can someone with Crouchgate use it and can we get this now? I'll, I'll tackle some of those. It's really helpful for people with Crouchgate because it can help not only at the ankle, but at the knee as well, and it helps create a more upright posture. In fact, some of our, our kind of biggest responders, positive responders to the technology are individuals with Crouchgate. And so um, if you're able to walk and you have Crouchgate, it, this device it tends to be very helpful. We've created the device so that it, it works with sneakers um, you need a shoe, like any shoe that would work with an AFO is really kind of what, what this device is geared towards. We are working to, to make it a little bit more universal <clears throat> so that different types of footwear could be used. Okay. That's something that we're working on, but right now it's more of like your classic tennis shoe. And uh, the device is not yet able to be purchased. The best way to kind of use the technology um, would be to try and get involved with some of our research. And one thing we're, we're really passionate about is getting, you know, doing research in the home. And so we're going to be searching for funding to do trials where we can send the device to people and they can use it at home and in their community. And so, you know, I welcome any, you know, any, if anyone wants more information, they can uh, more than welcome to get in touch. Unfortunately, the device is not yet for sale. We're um, wrapping up clinical trials and it's a device that's regulated by the FDA. And so um, it's going to be a little while before it hits hits the shelves, unfortunately. Is there, a t I know a little while can mean a lot of things. Is that like two to five years, five to seven, like which which of those big ranges do you, do you think and hope it falls under? Yeah. Um, two to five years is like, I would be shocked if the technology isn't available in two to five years and immensely disappointed. Um, when we started the company in 2019, we thought we'd be selling, we thought we'd be able to to deliver devices by now. Um, right, because you're five years in. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it's you know, it's a long, it's a longer road than we anticipated, but we are making good progress. And you know, um, I understand that there are many people that can benefit, and so just rest assured that we're working as as quickly as possible. And that's why we need great organizations like CPARF. Um, around so that the technology can, can can get there. I really appreciate that, Zach. Um, and I know we're like kind of at time, but I wanted to see if um, there was anything, Colin, that you wanted to add before we close out or Zach um, that we haven't already covered that you'd want either researchers or people with CP or caregivers of people with CP to know. Uh, yeah, we discussed uh brought up individuals, some adults with CP and kind of where they fit into all this. And I would like to, you know, know that we do see them. Um, I've had, we've had some adult participants come in as like when I was a child, there's all these studies available to me, there's all this help. And then as kind of as I got older and older and progressed, I felt like I got forgot about it a little bit. So um, the, the lab uh, NAU is currently working on a uh, high powered EXO. So it's got some big daddy motors in it, um, and it's a little bit, um, it can produce a lot more power to try to, you know, get into that population as well. So we haven't forgot about adults. We're we're focusing on a, a wide range of people with walking, walking disabilities, and we hope to help them all. Um, and then also um, you see us two here um, kind of representing what we're doing, but it takes a lot of people to produce this technology. Um, in our lab, we have um, mechanical engineers, um, electrical engineers, computer scientists, biomechanists. Um, it takes a lot of people to create um, these devices and put all those work. So I just want to recognize all the work that uh, the NAU lab is doing um, to to make this available. Colin, thanks so much for 
I'm doing that. And for that reminder, I, I want to do the same thing for the, the folks in the Biomodem family, in particular, uh, my co-founder, Ray, um, who's dedicated so much time and energy to, to helping with, with the company. Um, Colin's absolutely right. It is a huge team effort. And we just happen to be sitting in front of the camera today. Um, and there's many other worthy individuals on our team that ha are making as much or more impact. I appreciate the shout outs because it's just a reminder of what we've kind of been talking about all night, that all of this is collaboration and interdependence on different people and different perspectives, different skill sets. Um, I just want to thank you, Zach and Colin, for your time tonight. I want to thank everybody for attending. Um, if we didn't get to your question, I've grabbed them and we'll share them with Zach and Colin so that we can answer them and then send them to the folks who ask them. Um, keep an eye on your inbox for more programs like this coming up throughout the year um, and keep an Keep your ear tuned uh, for our podcast that will be released later in the spring. Again, thank you, everyone, and have a great night. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for having us.